I went to Paris in 34, and I went to a designing school. And then I met my husband, and I married in Paris. And so I stayed in Paris, and I stayed in France. That's how I stayed alive. Marietta and I, we used to go for a walk. We had to That's hold hands and go in really front of the parents and breathe deep yeah. and go very straight. And I don't know about Marietta, but I was always bored to death. I know, first of all. You, you hated it. But you know, now when I look back, I wish I could hold my father's hand and my mother's hand. I grew up in Czechoslovakia, and my childhood was the happiest time in my life. My mother always used to say, don't forget that you don't have a better friend than your sister. And we were thinking, well, yeah, what does she know, all right? But then the life taught us that she was right. The first anti-Semitic incident uh, that I remember distinctly, uh, was uh, marching uh, to the public swimming pool uh, for our swimming instruction. And there was a sign that said, uh, Juden uh, werden nicht erlaubt im Wasser. And I stepped out of line, and the teacher said, what's the matter? And I, I said, well, can you see, read that sign? It says, Jews are not permitted. Uh, to pollute the water. As soon as the Nazis came to power, which was January 30th, 1933, almost immediately, Jews began to experience assaults. There was a boycott of uh, Jewish stores uh, all over Germany. A Nazi was posted in front of the shop of my father's shop, and that people didn't come in there. But as the Nazis prepared for European war, they stepped up their measures against the Jews. I remember Nazis marching in the street with brown shirts and sang a song in English means, when Jewish blood is flowing, it's good to taste it, it tastes twice as good when they are killed. The SA, the stormtroopers, begin to drag people off the street, many of them Jews, torture them in basements, impromptu prisons. A line had been crossed, and many of them thought it would pass. I would say the real turning point was the violence of Kristallnacht. Kristallnacht happened on November 9th to 10th, 1938. It's a euphemism, the night of the broken glass. It's the reference to plate glass windows that had been broken in Berlin, uh, so many of them that they're ankle deep uh, on the street. I have a very clear recollection of Kristallnacht. We were all at home, my father, my mother, and myself and my two sisters. My uncle had been arrested at five in the morning and uh, that apparently uh, the arrests were aimed at the men in each family. The uh, Nazi party was designating the stores by having some stormtroopers mark each store that was owned by Jewish people. And then they were followed by uh, what was supposed to be a, uh, a mob of people, really, but it was all organized. And uh, they came and then broke the windows, destroyed the stores, looted the stores. They burned synagogues, hundreds of them in Austria and Germany. They vandalize thousands of Jewish shops and loot them. I went on the balcony and I smelled smoke. I said, my gosh, what is this? So I walked into my parents' bedroom and said to my father, Papa, please turn the radio on. On the radio he heard that all synagogues in Berlin were burning. The fire department uh, controlled the flames so that it wouldn't spread to the adjoining buildings. But uh, they didn't do anything to prevent the synagogue from burning inside. It was an unforgettable sight. And that was a very forcible uh, reminder of, of what had happened and what was to come. And around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, we had a doorbell ringing, and it was 
the Stuttgart Police Force. And they said, we are here to pick up Arthur Metzger, my father. They kill 100 Jews uh, and arrest 30,000 Jewish males and send them to concentration camps. My father then was in Dachau for four weeks and was finally released, totally bald, totally emaciated. His toes were all frozen and he could barely walk. He was that weak. This is physical violence condoned by, organized by the state, by government. And this, uh, you know, I think, removes any lingering doubts Jews might have had about being able to hold out. It, it, it makes them desperate to get out anywhere. It broke something within me, and uh, I decided that uh, I could not just be a good German and a good Jew anymore, than, uh, that our days were numbered. Increasingly, the avenues of immigration have been closed. The refugee situation around the world is saturated. No one wants to take more penniless refugees. Uh, so that even though they're desperate to get out, the opportunities to get out are simply not there for the most part. Everybody wants to get out after Kristallnacht. There just isn't enough time. We always thought, where shall we go? Where shall we emigrate? We have no money. I like to go to Shanghai. And my father and mother said, you must be crazy. What do you do in Shanghai and China? We have no money to pay for this. And what do you do? And my sister, two years younger than me, let him go. He will save our life. Let him go. 